This awful title allows me to go on to talk about preeclampsia and how we get involved with this condition in intensive care. This is a scene from the hit show Downton Abbey. In the 1920s, as Lady Sybil unfortunately illustrates, eclampsia was a significant contributing factor to maternal mortality. Thankfully, it is rare now, but in other areas of the world, maternal mortality is still too high, which shows that it's good to have a healthy respect for these conditions. Hypertension in pregnancy presents as a wide spectrum of disorders. A systolic blood pressure of greater than 140 or a diastolic greater than 90 after 20 weeks is classified as gestational hypertension. Preeclampsia is defined as hypertension past 20 weeks, plus one of the systemic features which we will come on to talk about. What's important to remember is that the placenta is vital to this process. It's essential in the development of preeclampsia and the major treatment is delivering the placenta. There are lots of complicated theories regarding the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and I think it's fair to say that it's very complicated and we're not really sure. Potential airway issues in pregnant women are well documented with an increased risk of difficult intubation and difficult mask, bag mask ventilation. We might need advanced airway care for seizure activity and general anaesthetic sections and in extreme cases, edema relating to preeclampsia can cause laryngeal swelling, which further complicates intubation. Patients with preeclampsia are at risk of developing pulmonary edema. The cause of this is likely to be multifactorial. Changes in hydrostatic and oncotic pressures, along with overzealous fluid prescribing, can quickly cause problems for us, and is something we need to be cautious about. Hypertension is usually the earliest clinical finding with preeclampsia. You get the horrible combination of intravascular depletion, widespread vasoconstriction and leaky capillaries which give edema. This can be really difficult to manage. The spectrum of neurological symptoms is vast. Headaches that don't respond to simple analgesia are common and other symptoms range from visual changes such as blurred vision or photophobia all the way through to seizures. Eclampsia only complicates one in two to three hundred cases of preeclampsia in Australia, but we're not very good at predicting when it's going to happen. Annoyingly, the onset of neurological symptoms and signs is rarely associated with the onset of seizures, so we're not likely to get any warning. They can also happen at any time, before, during or after labour. And it's important to remember that eclampsia is not the most common cause of seizures in pregnancy, so be careful to think of other differential diagnosis. Your initial priority is going to be the same as any other critical situation, airway, breathing and circulation. You might need some benzodiazepines in the short term, and our two main goals are to control the seizure and to control hypertension, with the definitive treatment being to deliver the baby as soon as possible. The MAGPIE trial showed that magnesium sulfate halves the risk of eclampsia and probably reduces the risk of maternal death. So in women who are at risk of eclampsia, you're going to give a bolus of 4 grams, followed by an infusion of 1 to 2 grams an hour, and these patients will need regular monitoring of blood pressure, serum magnesium levels and reflexes for 24 hours. In about 10 to 15% of cases, seizure activity may reoccur despite magnesium therapy. Significant proteinuria or a protein-creatinine ratio of greater than 30 are worrying signs. And this, as in the rest of our patients, a urine output of less than half a mil per kilo per hour is also a cause for concern. Adequately fluid resuscitating patients in the face of widespread vasoconstriction coupled with leaky capillaries is a difficult task. The answer probably lies in incrementally giving small fluid boluses, for example 250 ml of crystalloid, a monitoring response and this is where invasive monitoring may help guide us in really tricky situations. Admission criteria are different from unit to unit um, but sometimes it may be the case that with all the infusions, monitoring, time intensive nursing care that's needed it might just be easier to manage these patients in a critical care environment. I'm always a little bit happier when these patients have at least invasive blood pressure monitoring but this is not always necessary. We treat hypertension because of the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage and eclampsia. And in the acute phase, this may include oral labetalol and nifedipine. We sometimes need to use intravenous labetalol or hydralazine infusions 
and rarely we need them to progress to GTN or sodium nitroprusside infusions. We're aiming to get the systolic blood pressure consistently less than 140, and once we're over this acute phase, we then might introduce regular, longer-acting oral agents. And it's important to check on the safety of any of these drugs that we're using uh, well, with breastfeeding. Regional anaesthesia can be really helpful both during labour and caesarean section for mum, but also for the obstetric team that are trying to manage the hypertension. There may, however, be a coagulopathy or thrombocytopenia which contraindicates these methods. So general anaesthesia is acceptable and safe, but we need to think about the increased airway risk, about controlling any sudden surge in blood pressure or intubation, and about the increased risk of awareness. Adequate opiate doses and invasive monitoring may help prevent this. Help can be asymptomatic, but often presents with upper abdominal pain. Bleeding may be an increased issue, but management is largely supportive. Platelet therapy is generally not needed, but advice could be sought from a friendly haematologist. We're not used to dealing with babies or preeclampsia, so our midwifery colleagues are an invaluable source of information. I think it's got to be a good thing to get mum and baby together as much as possible, and I think we don't do this enough. And it's often important to remember that the new mum's partner is splitting their time between an ICU patient, a brand new baby, and lots of other family members. So it's worth taking a few minutes to check that they're doing okay as well.